right, everybody, we are back. As drummer of the heavy metal band Metallica, my next guest has sold 90 million records and won six Grammy Awards. Here he is in a scene from the new documentary Metallica, Some Kind of Monster, where he's in group therapy with the rest of the band. Well, I am not interested in playing music with you if you're not happy in there. I just don't want to be a, a become a parody. Okay, so if you're not happy playing music with me... <laughs> Please welcome Lars Ulrich. Thanks for being here. Thank uh, you for having me. I watched this, uh, this documentary today. They, the, you, you guys got me a copy. And it's unlike any rock documentary I've ever seen. Because what you think you're going to get is the real cliched. Right. It's the drugs. It's the drinking. And you are probably the, you are the most successful heavy metal band of all time. <laughs> 90 million records. You've got this image. But a lot of the movie is you guys getting together with a therapist. <laughs> and talking about your feelings. Well, it didn't quite start out that way. We, um, our bass player left the band in 2001, and after he left, we kind of asked ourselves, why do you leave a band of our success and, and our stature? And um, we realized we had to sit down and take a long, hard look at ourselves and kind of uh, get to know each other again and understand why we had such a hard time communicating with each other and so on. So this guy, Phil, the therapist, I guess that's what they're all called, right? He, right, uh, right. Came in to initially mediate the situation, and then we uh, kind of started embracing his way of um, of kind of looking at things, and um, it ended up being a two and a half year relationship. Just getting you guys to talk, because <laughs> the band, and you see it in the documentary, it looks like you're you're coming apart. It looks like the work is no longer fun. You're having trouble create, you know, and, and, and they're trying to get you guys talking to each other. Yeah, we just realized that after 20 plus years that uh, we didn't really know each other that well. And right. we really didn't um, function very well as a family. <laughs> right. And uh, me and the lead singer, James Hetfield, had kind of been, you know, the mom and dad, the, the bickering couple for those 20 years. And Kirk, our guitar player, had been the sort of forgotten child. And we just sat down and sort of started over and, and, and went back to day one and really got to know each other, resolved a lot of the issues uh, through the years that had never been talked about, and um, got a lot closer. And I recommend it to anybody. <laughs> yeah, but here's the, now, now, let's get to the problem now. Hardcore Metallica fans go to see this film. Are you a little worried that they're gonna uh, see their heroes, their gods, getting together in a room and going, I relate to what you're saying, man, and I feel closer to you now. Are they just gonna, uh, are they gonna I'm, reject it? I'm proud. I'm proud that we had the guts to stick with this. And mm -hmm. um, in some way, you know, Metallica and the relationship we've had with our fans through the years, I think, has always been based on accessibility. They've always felt very close to us because we've always sort of been as open as possible. And, and, and this, to me, is, uh, I think, the next logical step, maybe the last logical step. <laughs> right. Maybe it's the final nail in the coffin. I don't know. But it's... Um, Will it affect your music? Will the songs now be called things like, I can relate to what you're saying or... <laughs> Um, Feeling closer to you. I can uh, write a couple of those down. I'll yeah. take them back to the boys. I've got some beats for you guys. You're, if you want to talk to me, I could help. Um, it hasn't affected, it didn't affect the music on the St. Anger album. I mean, right. it's, it's probably our most aggressive, brutal, uh, hardest record that we've made in almost a decade. Well, this Lyrically, the, it takes it to another that's level. That's my next question is, clearly, you know, you guys started this band in your teens. In, in the you know early 80s. Late, late 50s. Late, yeah, exactly. <laughs> a different, Metallica had a different sound then, I tell you. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you guys started in your, in, your, in your teens. And clearly a lot of the music, you, you, you've gotta have some anger and you've gotta have, it's gotta be fueled by testosterone. And it was now, for a long time, right, it was me. for a long time. <laughs> now you guys are, I'm guessing, in your early 40s. You can see in the early, documentary. Early 40s. Early 40s, yes, early, that's what I said. 40s. Early 40s, late <laughs> early, 20s, early. early 40s. But you guys, and you can see in the documentary, you have loving families, you have really cute kids. Where do you get, where do you find what you need to make Metallica music now? Um, well, you know, two years ago when the process started, we didn't feel that it, it, it sort of... Um, affected the, the aggression and the energy that would come out in the music. Right. But the place that really made a difference was in the lyrics. Right. That we felt that we could um, 
we were sort of proud of our vulnerabilities and, and we, would, we were not uh, uncomfortable about opening up and talking right. about our insecurities and, uh, you know, our life experiences. And so it was, um, it was a lot of fun to kind of have the balances. And, and we were fiercely protective of, of this thing that we didn't think that the, 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 the group therapy and all the love would affect right. the aggression of the record. And I think that um, everybody who's heard the record feels that way. Right. So there were a lot of doubters in our the outer fringes of our inner circle, as we call them, who were right. saying, you know, how you guys are not going to be able to still retain that. But right. uh, we found a way, so it is possible. <laughs> there's, a very compelling, there's a very compelling moment in the movie I want to ask you about where you play a track for your dad, who you're obviously very close to, who, by the way, has one of the coolest Father Time beards I've ever seen. <laughs> and you play a track for your dad, and you ask him his opinion, and he says, I would delete it if I were you. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, First of all, that's, that, that's got to be a, a tough moment. What, what does that say about your relationship with your dad? My, we've had a great relationship. I grew up in Copenhagen, Denmark, with, mm -hmm. which was like the hotbed of jazz music in the 50s and 60s, and he was very involved in, in the jazz scene at the time. And um, he's always pushed a lot of, uh, you know, your John Coltrane's and Ornette Coleman's and Dexter Gordon's and all this type of stuff on me. So he's tried to get me to try and inject another edge into Metallica's music. So he's music. always so, pushed you yeah. and been honest. So when, yeah. I, when we play it too safe and, and, and so on, he always starts, he starts finger wagging me and he tells me that my drumming's too white or you know, some stuff like that. And he's always been um, the most brutally honest um, critic of Metallica and I love him for that, so it's all good. All right, well, I, I recommend this documentary uh, to anyone out there who, who I, I found it really fascinating. Thank you. And uh, it's clearly an ongoing story. Metallica, some kind of monster, is playing uh, in select cities. Lars, very yeah. cool to have you on. Lars, all right. We'll be right back with Jim Gaffigan. Stick around.